For the first time on this channel, I'm filming this video in 8K, and today I want to tell you a little bit about the process that led me here. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody, I'm Gerald Undone, and no hamsters were harmed in the making of this video. And now for some less absurd disclosures, there will be some gear that I talk about from Condor Blue during this video, which was provided to me for free. They didn't sponsor this video, but I do have an upcoming project with them that I'm really excited to share with you soon. Just wanted to let you know about my relationship there. This video does have a sponsor though, and that's Storyblocks. Now originally I had planned to make sort of one larger dedicated video on this topic, but because there's a lot of moving parts and because certain aspects are more time consuming than the rest, it turned out that I don't really know when I was going to make that video, so I decided just to make this one as sort of an update along the way. And this was brought on by that post that you might have seen, where I said that the Sony A1 was my new favorite camera, and I found myself using it a lot more than the Sony A7S III for video, and obviously I was using it all the time for photos. So just kind of like my one, you know, workhorse camera. Which is funny, because in the A1 video I said that I thought that I would rather have an A7S III and an A7R4 for photos. Well since then I've actually sold my A7R4, I still have two A7S III's, but I keep going to the A1 for video. So this video is going to be kind of an explanation of, you know, the different steps that I took to convert that because right now you're watching this video on the Sony A1 and I'm shooting it in 8K, sort of. Well, I, I am, but I'm doing both. Uh, and that's going to be a big component of this video. I've got some notes here that I want to go over. And another thing that I want to accomplish, which is when Condor Blue is going to come in, is a couple of years ago I made a video on the original Sony A7 III, how you could use it as kind of like a quick change photo to video hybrid video rig. And so I want to do that with an A1. So I want two A1s. I want my main A1 here, and I'm still waiting on another one, which I don't have yet, hence the moving parts and time consuming thing. And then I'm gonna make that second A1 my B camera for this kind of video so that they match perfectly, but also my photo camera. So I want to make it a quick change rig. So we're gonna build one of those out today. But first, I want to talk a little bit more about the 8K and 4K thing which I touched on a little bit in one of my Sony A1 videos earlier. So something I've noticed when I try to show you guys the difference between a camera that has oversampling or when we compare 6K to 4K or just small resolution differences that sometimes it can be difficult to see exactly what's going on, especially when we talk about line skipping versus pixel bidding. There's just, especially when it goes through YouTube, there's just a lot of little difficulties to really demonstrate everything. Well, earlier, a couple weeks ago, I found a way to, I think, really demonstrate this well, which is also kind of what led me to decide how I want to shoot with the A1. So what I was able to do, I have, a, I have an image here that I'm going to show you. This is how I recorded this image. Now this was, the idea here is this is a chart that's usually used for chroma subsampling. But I found that if I put it on my screen, my actual monitor, and then position the camera just close enough so that we can just start to get that screen door effect where you can see the pixels, and then I film that, it revealed everything, whether you've got line skipping, how the chroma subsampling is working, uh, the resolution, just all kinds of stuff. And this is what the image looked like originally. Now I took a bunch of shots that I I've cropped in on them so you can see them better because admittedly still when completely zoomed out and put through YouTube, it's still hard to see. But when we punch in to, you know, a four times crop, I was using this bottom section here. You see how there's blue letters on red and red letters on blue? That showed the problem really well. And I'm actually curious to see what this video itself is going to look like on YouTube. Anyway, so if we move forward an image, this one here is the A7S III's 4K. It's captured externally, but it's the same as the internal. Now if we look at the A1's 4K, so when you do the straight sort of line skipped 4K that the A1 has because it's taking such a high resolution sensor and line skipping it down to 4K, you get this which looks worse. And we can see a few things going on here. First of all, we can see that it's sort of blurrier overall, and we can actually see the line skipping in action. If we look, do you see how the, the lines here, they're not all the same and they shift colors? And if we punch in on some of the letters, you can actually sort of see the line skipping because you see how the letters are aliased, that they're offset and have jaggies, almost like there's like a wobble to them. That's what the line skipping is doing. Now, the next image is quite compelling, and this was the one that kind of blew me away when I showed it. This is what the 8K out of that camera looks like. You see how just night and day, every single pixel, let me punch back in, you can see every single little pixel like a light bright, and those lines are completely straight now, there's no jaggies, it's not blurry at all, and every single one of these vertical bars looks identical and is perfect. But now let's look at what happens if you do the process that I mentioned in a previous video, where we keep the camera on 8K, so you could record 8K to the SD card, but now the HDMI port is being recorded to a Ninja 5, and it's not being set to 4K external, because that would be 4K only, 
and you couldn't record on the memory card, so the camera's still in 8K mode, and we're getting sort of a oversampled image recorded to the Ninja 5. And I can finally sort of prove this more convincingly than I could in my previous video. Look at this image. Not as good as the 8K, I'll admit it. And if we flip back and forth, there's definitely something going on here in the blue where it's not quite as precise as the 8K. But if we compare this image here, this oversampled 4K to the Ninja 5, and we compare it to the regular line skip 4K, there is a huge difference, as you can see. Let me just flip back and forth again. It is dramatic. So this made me realize, okay, well, I have a couple options then. Because shooting 8K isn't exactly probably the best method using these mirrorless cameras, in my opinion, for this kind of setup. Just like I said with the Canon R5. It's okay for shooting some clips, but to do, you know, long form things and you have to edit it and everything else. And you know what? Let's take a minute to talk about editing performance. So this amazing looking 8K image on the A1 edits okay. And I think part of this is because it's 8K 420. So the the GPU is able to accelerate that a little bit. I'll maybe I'll put a little video up on the screen right now of showing you some scrubbing differences. The it's not bad. It's workable. I think if you added a couple layers of that, it would probably get bogged down. And I have a pretty high-end machine. But there's no comparison to this 4K recorded on the Ninja 5 from the 8K sort of oversampled image. This one edits perfectly smooth, like instantaneous, like you would expect from any kind of mezzanine codec. This was in DNX, but it doesn't matter if you do DNX or ProRes. Super smooth. So we're getting significant editing advantages using this method. I also did another test, which was to see if you take the 8K actual footage and you have an 8K timeline, and then you export it to 4K using Resolve, versus if you have a 4K timeline and you drop 8K footage onto that timeline and then export that as a 4K export. Because even though I'm shooting in 8K, I'm still rendering it out in 4K and uploading in 4K. But basically I want to know, is there better quality to do an 8K timeline and export it 4K, or to use a 4K timeline and just drop in 8K clips and export it? And I did maybe eight different tests of these with different combinations, and in each case they looked identical. So at least when using Resolve, assuming that your scaling doesn't change when you change timelines, I don't really see a difference between an 8K timeline and a 4K timeline with 8K footage if they're both being rendered out the same at 4K. Let's talk more about why did I bother switching sort of my entire A-roll setup to the A1 for this. Because it's more than just obviously, oh, I want the image to be a little bit sharper. Because it is sharper. But there's a few other benefits. Previously, I talked about that the noise performance is better. Uh, basically, the noise becomes finer when you shoot in 8K. So even if the noise was the same, there's smaller little bits of noise and it becomes harder to see. And when you upload to YouTube, the bigger blocks of noise, when compression hits it, it becomes you know more messy and artifacty. But when it's smaller, sort of like dithery, finer points of noise, the compression doesn't hit it as bad. So you actually get sort of a better overall compressed YouTube video as well, which is kind of handy. Also, when it comes to noise from exposure, there are some differences. Now, I love the a7S III. And I know this video, a little sidebar, I know it can be kind of frustrating from those comments where it's like, oh, John switched in the A1, he just told me to get the a7S III. This whole setup probably isn't very practical for most people. But I figured it it's much more expensive than the a7S III, and the improvements are kind of marginal. But I can do this, you know, I have access to this gear, so I can do these kinds of experiments for fun, and you can watch them. And uh, it's a lot easier than you doing these experiments yourself, you know, both monetarily and access to gear and everything. So I'm just doing this basically for your entertainment and also test things out. I do realize it's not as practical, and the a7S III is still probably a much better value package overall for video, unless you really need 8K. But yeah, finer noise. And then there's an exposure element to this as well. The A7S III, as much as I love it, has sort of a, a one weak spot for, for noise, which is before you hit that 12,800 point, but after you cross that like 3,200 point. So ISO 6400, for example, is pretty sloppy on this camera, but it's great on the A1. In fact, I would say the A1 either matches or beats the A7S III at every ISO up until 12,800, and then the A7S III kicks in. So if you want super high low light stuff, A7S III still wins. But if you're somebody that operates more in that, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 ISO zone, the A1's actually better. And that's exactly what I had happening here. I used to shoot my videos with the A7S III at F4 ISO 12,800. I, I did that because based on the way that I wanted to do the lighting, keep it kind of moody, that kind of thing, but I still wanted to have enough depth of field to keep the product sharp on the table, I was finding that I wanted to stop down to, you know, like F4 
three, F2.8, F3.2, somewhere in there. But that was putting my ISO in that muddy zone of like 6,400. So I thought, well, it's easy if I just go a whole nother stop um, to 12,800 because then that cleans up. But then I had to stop down F4. And I was finding I wasn't getting as good of background separation in that way, obviously, because now my depth of field was probably too much. Basically, it was just hard to find a perfect sweet spot. But the A1, when I was testing it for my initial review for it, kind of offered that because the A1 cleans up at ISO 4000, which allowed me to set this shot that you're looking at now. This is F2.2 ISO 4000. I should probably stop down a little bit more if I wanted to get more of the table. You can see I'm pretty out of focus here. But it does offer me better separation from the background. And I think if we compare the two shots, the F2.2 ISO 4000 on the A1 versus the F4 ISO 12800 on the A7S3, the A1 shot is more dynamic and I think maybe a little bit more pleasing to look at for this talking head presentation. But there's also some other things too, which you might notice in that side by side, which is that the A1, I think, is offering better skin tones. I mentioned this in my original video that the A7S3 and S log has a little bit of a green problem. And I've made videos on how to correct, or like how to deal with this and fix for it. And you can rotate the hue, you can change your white balance, stuff like that. The A1 basically has that fix already baked into it. And I find that Sony's been doing this with their last couple cameras as well. So that's their new attitude is they're less green than they used to be, which is great. It just means that I can shoot the A1 basically straight and like the skin tones where I have to do some corrections on the A7S III. Also, I tried to take this quality bump a little bit further and I thought, well, if I'm doing a whole new setup, let's pop a new lens on there too. And I was I put on the 35 G Master, the new one from Sony that I reviewed in January, I think it was. And I adore that lens from its quality. I think it's probably the best 35 millimeter in terms of image quality, but it has that focus breathing problem. And so I thought, well, I'm mostly stationary here, so focus breathing shouldn't really be an issue. And I was surprised to find out that it actually is. I'm using the 35 f1.8, by the way. I stuck with that. But if I lean back and forward, you can see that the frame isn't moving at all. With the G Master, even just moving this much was causing the frame to breathe in and out, which I found it looked distracting, especially if you have elements in the frame that kind of come in and out of the shot because they're right on the cusp. So as much as I like the quality better, the breathing kind of killed me on that. So that 35 millimeter G Master is gonna be reserved for photography, which I'm still okay with because I love it. And for photography, the focus breathing doesn't really matter that much for single shots, you know. Sequencing can matter, but not for single shots, which is mostly what I do. But yeah, so that's a practical focus breathing thing, which is interesting, even doing this can cause it. But the 3518 doesn't do that at all, so we're still using 3518. All right, now I'm still waiting on my other A1 to arrive, which is what I was gonna use for the build out. But since I don't have that one, I'm actually just gonna grab my other A7S III that I'm not using at the moment, because now I'm using the A1, and we're gonna build that out and pretend it's an A1, just for the sake of demonstration. But that one's already built out, so I'll keep sort of switching back and forth to it so you can see it in action on the A1 as well, and you can see the setup that I'm doing for this video. Now this one here is my old A7S III rig. I don't want to really call it old, like how old is it? But uh, this is the one that I was normally shooting, the one that we're going to build out now. But this was it, I was using small rig, and got the Ninja 5 mounted on top, and eh, you know, it's decent, it's treated me well. Got the Sigma 24 to 70 on here. And it's a great little combo. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this one up as kind of a close-up camera that I can use when I show you the parts. And then we're gonna do a little build-out. All right, give me a second. Okay, so got our proxy camera here. This is the A7S III. And uh, one other thing I wanna say, this video is kind of all over the place. I realize that. I hope you guys are enjoying this kind of like update style video. These are the kind of videos I actually really, really like to make where there's <laughs> sort of nothing on the line. I'm just experimenting with things I'm enjoying and having fun and just sharing it with you. Uh, but I know that they can be a bit scattered and they're a lot harder to like make a thumbnail and title for and package them for you, but I have the most fun with them. So I hope you're having fun watching this too. Tell you all about this stuff. Thanks to Condor Blue. Again, a lot of their stuff is great and I've been really happy with it with my first experiment, that camera up there. And while I unpack this, I will tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you could really use some footage, but shooting yourself was either budgetarily or logistically unfeasible? Well, Storyblocks has you covered with an impressive collection of stock footage covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K video. They're also amply supplied with backgrounds, overlays, After Effects templates. The interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. Okay, so got a bunch of Condor Blue stuff here. 
Now, a couple of these things, what I've got here, this is the, the uh, base rig for the Sony uh, A-series stuff. Some of these things don't come in the base rig, some of the stuff is extra. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll put all the links and we should be able to figure this all out. So, is this shot useful? Kind of, I don't know. Let's roll on this and see what happens. Where should we start? Let's start with the actual cage aspect. Okay, so this is what it looks like when you get the, the base rig kit there. And you have to actually assemble the cage yourself, which I think is interesting. And if you get the one for Sony, the top handle comes a little USB thing and there's actually a record button on the top so you can use the record button on the top handle to trigger recording on your camera. The screws to attach the pieces are already screwed into the sockets on each respective component. Can you see that there? And the correct size for that, they provide an Allen key, but if you're the type that likes to use your own, yeah, it's a two millimeter. So if you want to use your own Allen wrenches, this part's pretty straightforward. So I'll probably just blast through it so that you don't have to watch me screw a bunch of things together. Okay, so one of the main reasons why I like this whole Condor Blue base rig is for that purpose of using our A1 as quick changing from photo to video. So it can be my video B cam, but then also my primary photo camera. And for that, they have a little Arca plate that's held in place by this clamp. And you attach this to the bottom of the camera, obviously. And I also like that even though there's only one screw, these things grip on really tight and don't rotate that much. Now you can slide the camera in and out of the rig using that Arca plate. And if you have, you know, an Arca tripod or whatever that you like to use for your photography, well then you can just say this is all rigged up for video and just slide it out and then put this on your tripod and leave this whole thing set up here for your video rig. Another thing you want to consider though is that right here, can you see that? There's a screw there which is designed to go through the eyelet for the strap. So when you put the camera in, you can see that that eyelet lines up with that screw and that will give you a second point of contact and stop the camera from moving or wiggling. I'm not, I'm using it on that one, but I'm not gonna use it on this one because again, I want the camera to be able to come out of the rig quickly. So it doesn't make a lot of sense if I bolt it down in a bunch of different places. Anyway, so that's the first part there. And then we can use this thing on the side to hold it in place. Now I found that these don't come very tight to begin with and the Allen key that they provide doesn't actually fit in there. But if you have a three 30 seconds Allen wrench, then you can use that and put it right in this screw right here. And then you can tighten that up a little bit so that when you actually do clamp it down, it holds the camera really well in place. Okay, so this is the base rig part. Obviously, each step of the way here becomes more optional as we go. But this one comes with the Manfrotto 501 plate and it does have two uh, 3 eighths and a quarter 20. And so we can screw that into the bottom of our current setup here. So now we're sort of stacking quick release plates. And now this one on the bottom comes with a dovetail if you want that, or you can attach your own, uh, again, they have uh, two quarter 20s and one 3 eight. You can attach your own quick release plate to the bottom of this to go on your tripod or you can use a dovetail if you'd like, and that's built in. The top handle also comes with a rod that you can use to go through there if you want. Top handle's great, by the way. It's got four uh, three-eighths with locating pins, and they come with the quarter 20 to three-eight adapters already in them. Ton of mounting points on the sides. You've got a shoe on the back and on the front, and then more locating pins. <laughs> this is fun. You can get different lens cap covers. All right, I'll put it on for branding purposes. So if you take off your Sony cap, this is a Condor Blue uh, Sony cap that you can get. They have them for all the different mounts for cameras. So then it comes with uh, rods. So we're just gonna go ahead and put those through. And because I'm not really doing anything on the front, I'm gonna move them all the way to the back. They're locked down with a single tightening point on this side. Now this stuff is optional, by the way. This does not come with the base rig. This was something that I was interested in myself. This is Condor Blue's V-mount plate, and we're gonna slide that on the back here. And it's different for this one because this is the A7S III, so it's a flip-out screen. For the A1, you wanna make sure that you give yourself enough clearance for that sort of tilt-out deployment screen. So we'll put it here for now, that's fine. I'm just gonna tighten these down. 
We've got a charging port, I think is that's this one here. And then we've also got a 15 volt uh, AC port. They're all DC barrels. And then on this side, we've got uh, D-tap, and then we've got a combination of different outputs. So we've got the a 12 volt, a five volt, and then we've got a switchable 7.4 to 8.4, which is what I'm gonna use for this one. I'm gonna plug this one into there and put the selector, so plug in this barrel here, and then I'm gonna put the selector over to 8.4. And this is the one that's going to go in our theoretical A1, and it would go in right down here. And the advantage of using a dummy battery, which I already covered in one of my videos, is that it completely stops the A1 from overheating, at least in my tests. I didn't take it on a desert, we're talking inside, room temperature, running it for a long time. In fact, I've been running that camera now for probably two, three hours, doing both internal um, 8K switching the cards, and then also external to the Ninja 5, and it has no problems whatsoever, and I've done this a bunch of times. Now I've heard some people say they've had issues with dummy batteries in the past. Generally, I always recommend buying premium ones. In the past, I've had great success with Indie Pro Tools. They're the ones that I used for my original A1 tests, but I've also been having great success with Condor Blue's dummy batteries. This one is D-Tap to Sony L-Series battery. So we put that over here on the D-Tap side, and then that would go to our you know, monitor, wherever that would be. And then we'd run both of these things with a V-mount battery. Now something else that I like that I have with that current setup is that it's great to run things on battery power because that gives some versatility and with this dummy battery going in there, but the problem is that if this battery dies, then the whole thing fails. So what I like is that they also have this AC adapter that you can plug into that charging port that I showed you a minute ago on the side here and then plug this into the wall and that will give you, that will charge the battery when you're not using the camera and it will give you some active powering capabilities. If you use only the AC adapter and just the camera, you can actually take the battery off like this and the camera will still run via AC. But I found that if you also turned on the Ninja, then it sort of did more, I don't know how many amps is this providing? So this is outputting 19 volts at 3.42 amps, 65 watt max. So that could be the problem. I find that normally you need about five amps to run sort of a whole rig right out of the wall. So it's not a perfect solution, and I would suggest a Condor Blue, if possible, see if you can come up with a slightly more powerful AC adapter, if that will work okay with your V-mount plates, in order to make it so that you could actively power a few devices at once, or still charge your V-mount while in use, because right now that doesn't seem to work if I fully load up the plate. So that's my only real complaint there. And then yeah, we could use this articulating arm, you know, we could throw it on the side, and put the monitor on there and it works fine. Basically though, this is what I'm trying to do with the rig, is be able to power the camera and the monitor and everything off of this, have a backup with power, and then I can still release this clasp on the side and then push the little button in the back and take my camera out and then I can go use this for photography and it already has an Arca Swiss plate on the bottom. That's the idea for this, but I'm waiting on the new A1. Like I said before, I will make another update video sort of showing me the final results, letting you know if I ran into any snags, and then also talking about what am I gonna do with all this other gear, like this current A7S III and my other A A A7 III and some other gear that I'm gonna do a whole used gear extravaganza. So make sure you stick around for that. So yeah, I've been really happy with this whole setup. Thanks again to Condor Blue for supplying these parts so I could test this out. The test was a success, I like them. Do not expect them back. I'm going to keep them now and use them. And I will definitely be showing you guys the final build out when I get it done and when I get that second A1. And uh, yeah, my final note here says end video somehow. End of video. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Yeah, all right, I'm done.